Grambling versus Prairie View. The State Fair Classic is our game of the week. We have three matchups, two storylines, and one key to victory. Oh, yeah. It's Locked On HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked On HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day day and remember just because the mic cuts off does not mean that it's time for the journey to be over it just means it's time to follow me on twitter at south exclusives and today's episode is brought to you by underdog sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code locked on and get your first deposit doubled up to a hundred dollars and this game of the week between grambling and prairie view was listener voted on i We'll probably do this occasionally. I thought I was going to do it more often, but as the season has been going on, I've realized that most weeks thus far through, I guess this is week five now. So through most weeks, I've actually had a game that I knew I wanted to be the game of the week. One of those where if you didn't pick it, I'd be like, man, come on. Right. So I didn't want to have a situation where I was in here not giving the the energy to the episode or to the game that I wanted on this Friday. But on weeks when I'm not sure, I have a couple of games that are kind of equal in my mind, which I did this week. I had three. I put a poll up. The listeners voted the State Fair Classic. I even had somebody in the comments comment that it's the State Fair Classic. So here we are on Friday. What are we talking about? The State Fair Classic. And I would say that if I had to pick out of the three, this was probably my game that I was the most excited to watch. Let's get into the first matchup and one that I think is going to be extremely important specifically for the Grambling defense. And that is Lewis Matthews versus and his two players that I have him going against Antoine Ahmad and then also Trazon Conley. Now, I'll explain why this is kind of a 2v1 handicap, right? I've been watching more wrestling, so excuse me if some of my references pop out like this is WWE. However, this is kind of a 2v1 handicap, but I want to first explain why Matthews had to be the first matchup that I outlined in this game. And this comes from the high praise that Hugh Jackson gave him throughout the season. This is something that he said. I'll just give you a couple of like bullet points of things that he said rather than reading the whole quote. But Jackson called Matthews one of the heroes over there on defense, a consistent playmaker. The one guy you look over there is playing at a high level and one of the guys we lean on. This is huge praise for Lewis Matthews. And when you hear words like that, the one guy playing at a high level, which I don't agree with, but it's still a statement that's made. I think there's another player who I'm highlighting here on the defense that I do believe is also played at a high level. But you look at him. One of our heroes? How can I not have Lewis Matthews as one of the key matchups here? I don't highlight players, so I don't do highlight players. Otherwise, he definitely would have been there. But how could I not have a guy of his caliber, somebody who is getting the praise that he's getting from his head coach as one of my matchups? It just wouldn't make sense to me. It would be kind of reckless and irresponsible. So I had to make sure that I had a matchup, and luckily, Prairie View made it pretty easy. They made it real easy. You have Antoine Ahmad, who I don't believe Prairie View thought was going to be the guy he is right now on this season. Or excuse me, um, I think they expect him to be good. But when you look at the two deep, and that's the, the depth chart basically, the starter and the backup for each team or each position, Prairie View's two deep had Ahmad at the second back. And of course, you can have a two-headed monster, so it doesn't mean that he was just far behind Stewart. However, he was not the one. If it was 1A and 1B, he was not 1A. He is 100% the one right now, right? So I thought that Ahmad has came in, and he's played at a really high level. Um, Conley, he's gotten loose on the feet a couple of times. You know, he didn't do it too much in the, his second two games or his second and third game, I should say. However, against Texas Southern, he was a factor on his on his feet. So we know that he has the ability 
to do it. And that was the last time that they actually played a swag game. So maybe it's a swag thing. Maybe he dials it up. And I know he was dealing with a, a lower injury. I think it was an ankle. And maybe that kind of held back his running. We'll see what his health is like. He did miss a game this season due to that injury. So we'll kind of see what it's going to be. But both of those guys, whether it's the running back or if it's the quarterback scrambling, you're going to put the responsibility on Lewis Matthews. He's led the Tigers in tackles in two out of the four games this year. He's had double-digit tackle performances in two out of the four games this year he's a guy who's going to fly around and make plays he is one of the heroes on defense I just can't get over that because he really has high praise like to be called a hero to be called a hero on defense that's saying something that that is definitely saying something and when you look at a mod specifically because a lot of times we do this linebacker versus um running back type of deal and we just added Conley because he can make plays on it on his feet. However, Ahmad has averaged 5.5 yards per carry in every game but one. You know, at least 5.5. He's had, I believe, six yards per carry in one game. This guy has been really good. And he's going to be the heartbeat of the offense. I think that, um, I don't know what's going on with Maurice Washington if he's hurt. But if he's not, he should definitely get more touches because in the game, that we've seen him have more touches for Grambling, the running back for Grambling. He's been very effective, and I think that the running game is going to likely be a heartbeat for both of these teams' offenses. It's just about Lewis Matthews taking away that heartbeat from Ahmad and then also Conley. Um, our next matchup is going to be Tariq Mulmore versus the Grambling wide receivers, and this is one of the more important players on the PV defense. Right. So the Prairie View defense, one of their most important players is their leading tackler as well. And that's Mulmore. So I think that Tariq definitely is a player that you have to watch out for. But he plays the cornerback position and their leading tacklers are a cornerback and a safety. Typically, you would be kind of concerned about that because you would want your leading tackler to be in the front seven. A lot of times if your safety's up there, it means they're getting past that second line of defense. But Prairie View has the second best ranked defense or run defense in the conference. So it's not really something to be concerned about. Um, I say that the run game is going to be the heartbeat. However, if there was somebody who I knew could take it away, it'd be Prairie View, you know. So despite the defensive backs being the leading tacklers, it hasn't hurt their, their run defense. And also, they've been ran on more than anybody else. So it's not as if they only had 100-something running attempts while everybody else is in the 170 range. No, they're at 183, I believe. It's definitely in the 180 range. And they're number one. Nobody has had more rushing attempts against them than Prairie View. So I think that Tariq Momore is going to be an important part about that. However, the matchup, it's the matchup. The matchup is the wide receivers, and he's a nickel corner. So you never really know who's going to line up in that slot. A lot of times, offenses kind of just shuffle and play musical chairs with who's going to be in the slot on a play-by-play -play basis. So he'll see a bunch of different faces, a bunch of different tendencies, and he plays one of the more difficult positions to play. Right, because every wide receiver has a two-way go. There's no sideline to help you or anything of that nature. And then also, you're looking at a player who's going to be in the mix a lot because we talk about the wide receivers, and yes, that's the matchup. That's the one that you need to look out for. However, it's also the running game because, like I said, he's the leading tackler for the team, and he's going to mix it up. That's why the nickel position has become so important because they're always close to the mix. So you have to watch out for him, whether that's creating pressure on the quarterback or just getting in the backfield and stopping – plays he's only had half a tackle for a loss however he is the leading tackler and they have a good defense so his tackles are not too far down the field that's just something that you have to watch for if you're prairie view and then lastly you got sunday out anderson versus the prairie view offensive tackles and i don't believe that matthews is the only guy over there playing at a high level you look at anderson anderson is a stud if you want a sign of respect for sunday out anderson let's look at our guy, Coach Huggins. I keep forgetting who made the post, but Coach Huggins made this post where he broke down the leaders in FCS disruptive stats. That's what I call them, right? But this really tackles for a loss and sacks combined. And Sunday Yada Anderson was top five, and he had 1.8 per game. This is right after the Bethune-Cookman game, so right after last week. This is current right now. And with that being the case, who was in the comments? You had um, Kamari Averitt, brain fart, but you had Kamari Averitt, in the comments saying Anderson nice that's just a co-sign right after 
the game. And if you want to see a sign of respect, somebody who has fresh firsthand knowledge of what Anderson can do, this isn't watching film. This is somebody who probably had to block Anderson on a couple of attempts. I've seen Avery get his head in there and have to block defense alignment quite a bit. He knows what Anderson can do. So that's just kind of a sign of respect. But overall, Anderson has 4.5 tackles for a loss. He has three sacks on the season. He's a guy who's going to disrupt you at all aspects of the game. He's had a tackle for loss in every single game. He's had a sack in the last three games. And then also he has two forced fumbles on the year. So he has disruptive stats and he also has game changing plays as far as turnovers go. You can't say that Anderson isn't balling. So um, I appreciate the praise for Lewis Matthews. However, Sundiata Anderson is going to need some of that same love as well. Before I get into the two storylines going into this game, I would love to tell you about underdog because... This is one thing you have to know about Underdog. It's all about being easy. The episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, and they call themselves the easiest place to spice up your college football season, right? So we know that easy is something that they want. And if you want ease, it's, it's less effort. It's easier on you. And who doesn't want it? Who doesn't want that? Like, just tell me that. If you don't want that, drop it in the comments. If you do not want easy, drop it there, right? So, this is one thing that you have to know. It's all about the over-unders. If you want the quarterback to have more than 150 yards, boom, you can bet on that. The running back's going to have less than 75 yards. You can bet on that. Receiving, it's all about the over-unders throughout that year, and you just continue betting. You can have two to five options, and it's all on you. Super easy. No worrying about the game as a whole, just certain parts of the game. So just go ahead and go to Underdog and make your own picks the same way that I would. It's easy to play, in, and it's available in over 30 states. Pick two to five players across any team, and it's one of the easiest ways to play fantasy out there. Sign up with the promo code locked on, which is one word, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Deposit $100, get $100 back. You just go to underdogfantasy.com or to the Underdog Fantasy app. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code locked on. Get in on the college football pick 'em action. As we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every single day, you a real one for that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I want to get into a game that has a rich history. But the first storyline is that it's new coaches. This is a very, very rich history within this game. I went to the State Fair Classic, I think about five years ago, and the environment is ridiculous. Both of these teams have really strong Dallas alumni, so they're and they travel well, right? So um, I've seen Grambling travel well. Prairie View was only an hour away from me at Texas Southern. So I don't know if I, how, how well I count that or how much I should count that. But, um, yeah, Grambling has always traveled well. And every time I go to this game, I've seen these two pack out the stadiums in a way that I don't see at every game I go to. So this is definitely going to be a game that has a lot of energy. I'll say that a lot of energy involved in it is going to be an atmosphere that if you're able to be there, you should definitely be there. But here's, here's the thing. Game been going on for 38 years. Prairie View has won the last four games. But how much can I really weigh everything that's happened before this year when you have new coaches in the old game? Bubba McDowell has never coached in this game as a head coach. Hugh Jackson ain't never coached in this game, period. This is his first year at Grambling. So maybe if Coach Dooley had left, who, ironically, Dooley sparked that winning streak against Grambling. But if if... Dooley had left and maybe Fobbs was still here, right? You might be able to say, well, McDowell has been on the, the staff that has beaten Fobbs' team for five years and four years in a row. However, now it's Hugh Jackson. You ain't got no tendencies. There's no familiarity in this game. There's nothing that just says, oh, I can call back to that. You only have, if you want to be honest, you only really have four games to call back to. And that's interesting. It's like first time these guys match up. So all of that history and stuff for me goes out the window. It doesn't really matter anymore because these two teams aren't a part of that history. These coaches aren't a part of that history. The style isn't really a part of that history. Yeah, Bubba McDowell might have some tendencies that Dooley had, but it's not as if Hugh Jackson knew that from Dooley anyway. And matter of fact, he hasn't even played Southern yet to know what Dooley does. So it's not a situation where there's any kind of familiarity, and there might even be more of a feeling out process towards the earlier part of a game, similar to how any regular game would be, right? Um, and within that... Um, Feeling out process, it kind of leads leads into our next topic, our next storyline. How fast does Grambling start? That's something that I think we should all be looking for. 
In their one game that they won, it was an absolute blowout, and that blowout started and pretty much was concluded in the first half. We knew what was going to happen after the first 30 minutes of action. I can't say that's the case in every game. It was the case in the first game, but in the opposite direction. You knew they were going to lose after the first 30. In the second and third game, or the third and fourth game, excuse me, there was no, oh, I know what's going on. It wasn't any of that, right? It was more so this game is good, and we'll get into that after, right? <laughs> but when you talk about that first half, how fast are they going to start? Let's read off some of the things that they have done in the first half. So Grambling has scored a touchdown in the first quarter of their last three games. They put up double-digit points in the first half of their last three games. You know that these guys have talent. I just talked about Lewis Matthews. He's a hero, right? I got the Marvel shirt on right now, so it's only proper that we talk about heroes, but so I can't, I, I kind of feel wrong because I just did the Superman shirt rip. Yeah, they're going to have to take my MCU card for that one. Anyway, so when you look at the first half, it's clear that the coaching staff knows how to get them into a place where they can exploit the opponent's weakness. So that's not the thing. The, the pregame versus pregame game plan in talent versus talent, that's good. Grambling got it, right? They can do that. The defense hasn't been as, as good as the offense. You know, they're giving up more points than you would like them to give up. However, they do have splash plays. And with having splash plays, that kind of counteracts that. Let's go through game by game. Because we already talked about how the offense has put out, you know, good output. They put out 41 points in a the game. They blew out uh, Northwestern State. They know how to score in the first half. In the second, or excuse me, in the first half of the defense, you're looking at against Arkansas State, there's no splash plays, period. They got blown out in that game. I don't think it's a coincidence, right? Then against Northwestern, you had an equal first and second half. Um, they were just really good that day. So you had two picks in the first half, two fumbles forced in the second half. So you're happy with that defensive performance all the way through and through, but you blew out that team, right? Now you look at Jackson State. They forced two fumbles. This is talking about Grambling's defense. Forced two fumbles in the first half. You look at Bethune-Cookman. There was no turnovers on the day, but they were able to have a safety. So these are splash plays that you're seeing out of the defense going into the first half. But the key to victory is about what do you do in the second half? And we'll talk about that as we continue with Locked on HBCU. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, it was very, very, very difficult for me not to get ahead of myself. The storyline is, what does Grambling do in the first half? That was, the core, that was one of the storylines that we're looking forward to because the offense has done really well in the first half. The defense has had splash plays in the first half. However... The key to victory is second half adjustments. And it was hard for me to just continue talking about the first half without really, you know, kind of referencing some of the second half issues. But that's it. We talked about this with Grambling earlier in the week, and I was not sure at the time that this was going to be our game of the week. However, you heard it. We alluded to it. We alluded to it when talking about Grambling having to earn the G back, right? That was on Tuesday's episode. If you want to go back and call to that, um, one of my more creative thumbnails, right? So I added a little something to a picture. I was proud of myself for that one. But here, let's get into Hugh Jackson's comments because, remember, we talked about this on Tuesday, which means it was after the latest game versus Bethune-Cookman. This is Hugh Jackson's comments before the game versus uh, Bethune-Cookman. My biggest takeaway is that we can play with a lot of people, but can we finish? That's the question. The first half looked like a really good football game. The second half was totally different. I have to find out why that is. In the second half of three games, we've been different. My charge as a head coach is to find an answer, and I will, but I think our, our team will compete. We will have to understand that the second half is more important than the first half. Once we get that, I think we'll be fine. These comments were made, you hear him saying, in of three games, right? These games or these comments were made before the second half of the Bethune-Cookman game in which you still struggled. So you address it as an issue, you strip the G off the helmet, and you still have these same problems. You know, so it's, it's one of those things where, and I'm not blasting for stripping the G off the helmet, it is what it is. However, you thought that was going to be a motivational tool that was going to get them together probably right away. But it wasn't. So now it's back to the drawing board. We have to find a new thing to fix this. And I think a lot of times you're going to have to point the finger to the coaching staff. I think the lack of second half adjustments in every single game, you're going to have to point it to the coaches. Coaches, 
because yeah, the, the, the talent is out there, but you can play with them. It's like I said, I know he got the talent. However, when it comes to making adjustments, they're adjusting to you better than you're adjusting to them. If that continues, you're not going to win many games, right? So you have an issue that is clearly identified. Um, and if you really want to dig deeper into it, it's every single quarter. It's every single quarter. Even when the defense is playing well, because I don't think the defense has really struggled too badly outside of the Jackson State game. The Jackson State game was ridiculous. But I think that was just a, a, a situation where Jackson State stopped shooting themselves in the foot and it showed who the much better team was. I think that's what that really was. However, when you really look at Bethune-Cookman, probably the most evenly matched game that they've had this year. It's it's not it's not good performances. But overall the defense they've been outscored in every third and fourth quarter. I'll put it like that. They put they've been outscored in every third and fourth quarter and every time it hasn't been because the defense has allowed a lot of points. They've been outscored 7 to nothing before. So, but every third and fourth quarter they have lost. Not one or the other, not totality, every individual third quarter in every individual fourth quarter grambling has been outscored and that's just unacceptable um they haven't been blown out in the first half of any game except except for arkansas state that happened um but overall they've won either the first or the second quarter in every other game they've outscored the team what they haven't outscored the team in both quarters in every game they lost the first half technically against jackson state but overall they've been effective in the first or second quarter of every single game you can't really say it's bad game plan in the start. I don't think you can really point out that it's bad talent unless everybody's just slow starters. It has to point the fingers to the coaches. And then when it comes to the quarterback or when it comes to Prairie View, getting after the quarterback is the key to victory. And it's easier said than done because Jackson State or excuse me, Grambling State has not allowed many sacks this year. Prairie View has been pretty good at getting after the quarterback, though. We talk about Sundiana Anderson on the Grambling side. There's no one guy for Prairie View, but they have gotten to the quarterback pretty well. They got after um, Demetrius Davis four times and also sacked Miles Crawley one time. So that's five total sacks versus Alabama State. You're looking at a, a coach or a team who knows how to get after the quarterback, a coach who knows how, how to get them after the quarterback. He was a defensive backs coach, so he knows how to get lockdown coverage. This is a situation where if Hawkins uses his legs in the same way that he did against Bethune-Cookman, you're going to have to make sure that you rush more disciplinedly. But overall, that's the key. He's giving you two interceptions in each of the last two games. If you can heat them up, you might be able to force more mistakes. It's really that simple, and that is the key to victory for a Prairie View a and m And then lastly, I want to do a little quick hit around the HBCU landscape. J uh, Jarvion Howard has had his second Newcomer of the Week award. This time, he had 299 yards with multiple big play touchdowns against UAPB that got him a co-offensive player of the week and then also newcomer of the week again for the second time this guy's had two big games and Alcorn has a nice trio of running backs to really go up against and then also two edge rushers from Fayetteville State in the game versus Chowan Cameron Morrell had 12 tackles three tackles for a loss three sacks and a forced fumble while Devin Cowan had 10 tackles 2.5 tackles for a loss so excuse me, two and a half tackles for loss and then two sacks. So together, you're looking at 22 tackles, five and a half tackles for a loss, five sacks. That's a dominant performance from your edge rushers. And I just want to do quick hits highlighting that Howard has been one of the better running backs in the conference this, this year and has had two newcomer of the week awards. Got to watch out for Alcorn, man. I'm telling you, cream of the crop over there in the SWAC West right now. And until somebody proves otherwise, that's just what they're going to be. And then also two Fayetteville pass rushes last night versus Chowan. Just dominant. Just absolutely dominant, man. Make sure y'all checking out Trench Talk with Coach G because he's going to break down these guys in a much more eloquent and much more detailed way than we can do right here during our quick hits. Trench Talk, Coach G. Make sure you guys follow him on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, I'll tag his stuff down below. Um, but yes, that has been our game of the week Grambling versus Prairie View, the State Fair Classic. New coaches in an old game. Who comes out victorious? Let me know who you think is going to win in the comments below. And we'll be back on Monday to cover this game. In the meantime, in between time, make sure you're checking out our conference shows for your second listen of the day. I appreciate you making us your first listen of the day. And you can follow me on Twitter. Until the next time that we hear each other, family. Take care. Stay blessed. Peace.